Go. All right. Glad you're here tonight for uh, our summer refresher 2020. Uh, we're continuing on in spiritual warfare. Uh, tonight is our feet shod with the gospel of peace or shoes of the gospel of peace. As we look at tonight, I want to uh, spend a few minutes and and I know that uh, a lot of information uh, on the notes that I handed out and we'll see some slides uh, here tonight as well. But I want to spend a few minutes. Let's look at the verse first. We'll read all the verses about the armor of God. Then we'll hone in on verse 15 and then spend some time looking at some things about this and develop some uh, information I believe will be a benefit to us uh, as we in the midst of spiritual warfare. Ephesians chapter 6, uh, verse number 15. We'll read in verse number 10 and then read down into there. We'll start out, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Tonight, verse number 15 is where we want to really focus when the Bible says, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Remember this, that Satan does, and he'll continue to do all that he can to hinder us from realizing the purposes of God. Amen. He desires more than anything to keep us as Christians discouraged, disappointed. He wants us to not focus upon Christ, but focus upon our situations and yeah. focus upon our circumstances. Yeah. Now, it's interesting to me that we could say, well, yeah, preacher, you chose to talk about spiritual warfare and, uh, in the summer of 2020 because look what everything is going around. Can I tell you something? This would be apropos if it was 2019, 2018, 2021, 2022, because that Satan never stops uh, working to destroy believers and their testimony. Amen. 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 So it doesn't make any difference what year we're in. This is still something that we can apply, something that Paul wrote. This, if you would, is this not for the summer, but it's for each and every day that he tells us to put on the whole armor of God. See, there is war in the life of a believer. And the war began at the moment of our salvation. But here's good news. Man, that we have some principles that we can apply in our lives to show us that we can have victory over Satan. Notice, first of all, and when we look at this concept, let me backtrack real quickly. <coughs> when we look at this idea that we're in war, spiritual warfare, and the concept tonight about putting, uh, if you would, upon our feet, uh, the preparation of the gospel of peace, if we don't take these five principles about victory over Satan and we don't apply them to our life, we're not going to have the peace we need when it comes to battling each and every day. And so it's important for us to understand that. And so notice, number one, the principles of victory over Satan. Number one, we need to recognize that Christ has already defeated Satan. Satan has already a defeated foe. Man. Our problem is, is that we don't recognize that as believers. Why? Because we see him actively working in the world around us. Yeah. So we think, well, how can someone that is a defeated foe still be as active as Satan is today? Amen? Yeah. And I, my own self, I, I have that problem too. 
I look back and I think, well, wait a minute. If he's defeated, how come he doesn't stay down? I like watching boxing. I used to like watching boxing uh, when I was a kid. And, and when somebody was done, they counted to 10. Uh, when a 10 came, uh, the foe didn't attack uh, the victor, if you would. He stopped. The, the battle was over. Uh, the boxing match was through. If you watch UFC, this um, fight to the death, so to speak, it's a tap out. And when they're tapped out, the fight is concluded. Uh, when you play sports, at the end of nine innings, uh, the, the loser goes to the dugout and the winner goes to the dugout. It's finished. When you play football, what happens? Four quarters might be overtime if it's a tie, and it's done. It, doesn't, it does not carry on someplace else. It's finished. I mean, sports is like that. When you make a recipe and you're putting everything together, all the ingredients, and you put it into the oven, you don't pull it out of the oven and add things to it. Once it's cooked, it's done. It's finished. It's completed. And so in our minds, we look at those things and we think, wait a minute now, Satan is a defeated foe. And yet what's happening in our lives is that we are looking at him still being active and we cannot comprehend that. But understand this, he's a defeated foe that just keeps on getting up and keeps on causing us havoc. And one day he'll finally be cast into the lake of fire, praise God, forever and ever, and never will he be allowed to bother us again. But we need to recognize him that Christ has defeated him. He's already dealt a defeating blow to the enemy. And we're not to forget that the one who came has defeated our enemy. Number two, we need to recognize the power of Christ in our life. 1 John 4, 4, it tells us, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And so we notice that we recognize the power of Christ where? In us. And again, at the moment of salvation, we were indwelt with the Holy Spirit of God. Or if you would, we were, we were indwelt with God the Spirit. And so He gave us all that we need. And the power that defeated Satan dwells where? It dwells in us. Greater is He that is in you than He that is in the world. And so we need to recognize the power of Christ in our life. When we're saved, we receive the Spirit of God in whom is the power that defeated Satan. Can you see why we can have peace because of this? We Man. realize that we've already seen victory over Satan. We realize we have the power of Christ in our life to defeat Satan. And thirdly, we can resist Satan. See, principle number one is to recognize that Christ has already dealt a death blow to Satan. Principle number two told us we are to recognize the power that defeated Satan is in us by the Spirit of God. And number three, it says that we are to resist Satan because we have the power to do so. Now, as I look around tonight, and maybe even some of you that are uh, watching online, you might, might remember there was a comedian that used to always say, how come you did this? The devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. And it's really what happening is that he's putting uh, all that he did. I know it was a joke and we laughed and he hung around. We thought it was funny. But notice something interesting. What we've attempted to do, we've attempted to put something on Satan that does not have to be on him. Why? Because we can resist him. We don't have to let Satan do it in us. We don't have to let Satan uh, control us. Why? Because we can resist him. Because we have the power to do so. You say, what do you mean by resisting Satan? It means that he does not have to have a foothold or a threshold in our lives. We can resist him and keep him out. But you know what we do a lot of times? We put our guard down and then we do say, the devil made me do it. Why? Because we put our guard down and got involved in whatever is going on around us. Number four. Don't give Satan a place in our life. Hey, we are to make sure that we're aware of Satan's devices and that we are to flee temptation because when we're not aware of Satan's devices and we do not flee temptation, guess what we do? We then give Satan a place in our life. We allow him 
to sneak in and take a part of us and let him indwell in us and control us. See, we can resist Satan by expressing God's powers in our life. And we don't want to give him a place. And how can we not give him a place? Because we need to be aware of where he's coming from. And notice the things that he attempts to do in our lives. And what he lays out there to do in our lives. And so we're not to open up anything that allows him to come in. You know, it's interesting. When we look at this concept about giving Satan a place in our life, he comes to us in two ways. He comes to us as a roaring lion, and he comes into us as a serpent that will dwell within it, would dwell among us. So if we look at the concept, and we know there's a roaring lion on the outside of our house, are we going to open the door and invite him in? None of us would do that. If we knew that a snake was able to get into our house, would we not do all that we can to seal up every crevice, every area where a snake could come in? Right. I can guarantee you this. I have a wife. My wife would never allow me to have an area of a crack knowing that critters could come in the house, whether it's a spider, a snake, a roach, because we know we have sewer roaches in Arizona, and they're huge old things. Whenever we have monsoons, here they come. And she don't want any of that stuff in the house. So if that's the case, and we're going to make sure we seal things up, not to allow a roaring lion to come in, and not to allow a serpent among us, then why do we, as individuals, open up areas of our life to allow him to come in? Amen? Why do we do that? Why don't we seal up every area we can to make sure that Satan does not have a place in our life? You say, well, how does he get in today? I believe he gets in through our eyes, through our ears, and through our minds. And if, our, if those things are not sealed up, guess what he'll do? He'll come in through our eyes. Things that we see, we've got to be careful and we kind of laugh about that. Oh, you know, oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. But in reality, we need to be careful of what we see, what we're, what we're drawn to. We need to be careful about what we hear, things that we hear. When we hear negative things and we become discouraged, Satan then jumps in on that discouragement and we give him a place. And we begin to put thoughts into our minds and not cover ourselves with, if you would, with the helmet of salvation without taking the Word of God and putting it into our minds. What do we do then? We've given Satan a place in our mind. We've opened up a crevice to allow him to come in. Notice, fourthly, we need to let, we need to let God, Christ control our thought life. We need to let Christ control our thought life. And notice the importance of him doing that. Go to 2 Corinthians, if you would, uh, chapter 10, verse number... Pardon, pardon me. 2 Corinthians, chapter 10, and look at verse number 3. 2 Corinthians, chapter 3, uh, chapter 10, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we're not warring after the flesh. We do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are what? They're not carnal but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And then Paul begins to say, what are these things that we need to pull down? Because he says in verse 4, pulling down of strongholds. Then look at verse 5, casting down imaginations. Can I tell you, our imaginations are sometimes our worst enemy. I look about today and, and I'm listening to all the things that are going on uh, here in Tucson, and uh, this young boy that was um, uh, was on high on uh, cocaine uh, today, or, or last couple days anyway, and the policeman tried to subdue him, and all kinds of loony stuff ended up happening. Uh, they couldn't control the guy. They gave him Narcon. He's still uh, going, just going off on him, and all kinds of things. Unfortunately, uh, they put a blanket on him to hold him down, and ended up killing the kid. And he ended up dying. Now we're listening to all of the situations around us. And uh, I just heard tonight that our police chief resigned. And all of these things, our old policemen resigned today. All of these things that are going on. The mayor's calling for reform and 
I, I tell you, be honest with you, uh, as soon as I heard all those things, my imagination started going wild. I mean, honestly, I'll be honest with you. I start thinking, oh my gosh, what's going to happen next? Are there going to be riots in Tucson? Uh, is there going to be marching? Are they going to tear stuff up? Is burning down? Uh, what's going to happen? Because why? Our imaginations begin to kick in. And notice something important. We need to allow Christ to, con to control our thought life. Why? Because if not, our imaginations will control it. And pretty soon our imaginations are normally things that will not even come to pass. And we begin to focus on those. And we become consumed by those things. And then fear kicks in. And then pretty soon, guess what happens? Man, we're basically sitting down discouraged and disappointed. And Satan now has a stronghold in our life. And so we've got to cast down imaginations. And every high thing that exalted itself against what? The knowledge of God. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So no wonder that we don't have peace in our life because we don't use these principles of victory over Satan. And we don't take these principles and apply them to our life, then peace is going to leave us. Amen? Amen. Let me give you a couple Amen. things real quick tonight. Number one, what are the functions then of the shoes? So we notice that it's the shoes of the gospel of peace. That's what we're to put on our feet. And so notice, we're talking about gospel of peace, our feet being shod or those things placed upon our feet. So what exactly then are the function of shoes? Well, we notice there's a gen general uh, function of shoes. Uh, there's some places that we really wouldn't go barefoot. Uh, Arizona's not a place that uh, I run around outside barefooted. Uh, in fact, I don't go barefooted hardly any place, but Arizona would not be a place uh, I would go barefooted. The cement's too hot. Asphalt's too hot. In fact, I try to walk our dog on a regular basis and uh, in the morning, early in the morning, as you know, when the sun is still or the weather is still about 76, if it gets up a little bit above 80, it's you got to be careful. The sidewalk starts getting hot. The asphalt gets hot. And so notice, there's some places, man, we just don't go without without proper uh, footwear. Uh, we know in some cultures, though, uh, that the soles of people's feet, man, they're like leather uh, because they go barefoot everywhere. Uh, they've got callus upon callus upon callus, and uh, they can run out, if you would, uh, out in the desert. They can do whatever because their feet have been, uh, if you would, developed and have been uh, uh, hardened uh, almost like a leather sole. Uh, we need to understand how terrible the terrain was uh, during the time of Jesus Christ. It would be hard to walk over cobbles and rocks and pebbles and thorns in that part of the world. And so we see why they had to wear shoes to protect or for protection of their feet. Well, the specific function of shoes, especially for the Roman soldier, is that the soldier would not go into battle wearing an ordinary uh, leather sole with a slick bottom. Now, I know that most of our shoes today, uh, they're usually leather uh, uppers and usually rubber or plastic or some kind of synthetic material uh, for our soles. But if you go and get a good pair of shoes, you're going to pay some money for them, and you'll have leather soles on a pair of shoes. Years ago, when we first started in the ministry, uh, somebody gave us some money to go out and buy a pair of leather dress shoes. And I had taken those shoes and wore through the soles so many times uh, that finally I went to the cobbler and he said, I can't sew uh, any more sole on them. Uh, you don't have, if I start doing that, and then the shoe's going to be too small. Your foot won't even be fit, you know, fit into those things. Then I had those forever. Shined them up, polished them, kept them clean. But the bad part about it, when you first put on a new sole of those things, man, I remember standing on something, and it felt like your feet's going to go out from underneath you because of the leather sole, and it's slick, it's not all, uh, not indented or not been worn out or used as yet. And so notice that a soldier wouldn't go into battle uh, wearing an ordinary leather shoe, 
uh, with a slick bottom. If he did, then he would slip and slide. And so having the proper shoes could possibly save a soldier's life. See, any soldier fighting conventional battle would be at a serious disadvantage without shoes and without boots because the terrain would dictate what they're fighting in and how they would fight. Man, it would be bad if a, if a warrior or a soldier is out there battling against another soldier, against the enemy, and he steps back and steps on a, a thorn or a rock or something uh, that would cause issues to his feet. Because the focus would not be on the enemy, but it would be the pain that would be coming up to his foot, up to his leg, to his brain, and telling him, watch out. And so notice, they need to have shoes. They needed to wear boots. Well, the soldier's footwear, it serves several functions, but the two main functions are this. Number one is protection. It's for protection. So during the time of the Roman Wars, the enemy would place uh, razor-sharp sticks in the ground facing the approaching army in hopes of piercing the feet of the soldiers. So it would go through the foot. And once that the soldier's foot has been pierced, they're out of war. They're out of the battle. They have to sit down. They have to stop. They could not proceed on. So what did the soldiers do then? The Roman soldiers would wear a boot with a heavy sole that could not be pierced. Because if a soldier's feet were pierced, they couldn't walk. And even if the soldier was the toughest, the strongest, the most uh, a battle a tested soldier around, uh, if they could not walk, guess what? They could not fight. That's right. They were done. They were finished. They would have to sit back. So do you see why that he tells us that we are to stand therefore, verse 14 of our text, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness. And he said, but don't forget to put on the right shoes. Make sure we have the right footwear. Make sure they, which if you would, in fact, it's kind of funny sometimes when you think about footwear, uh, we want to make sure that uh, we wouldn't wear tennis shoes with a suit or we wouldn't wear tennis shoes with a dress. Uh, most folks wouldn't. Uh, we want to make sure we have the right shoes for the right clothing. I remember years ago that we were going to a fellowship meeting and we we're leaving Riverside and we we're going to El Centro, which is about two miles or two uh, hours away or so. And it was me and Brother Duncan and a missionary, uh, Brother Dennis Horn, to Bolivia. And so we get in the car. And, of course, I live two doors down from the parsonage. Uh, Brother Horn had, was staying in a fifth wheel uh, on the property at the time. And Brother Duncan had to come in and pick us up and take us down to uh, El Centro. And so uh, I just ran home, got my stuff, made sure I had my clothes on, tie, shirt, jacket, pants, all bit, dress shoes. I uh, got into the car. Well, Brother Horn gets in, and he's going to change his clothes when he gets there because he's doing some work uh, on his truck and hurried up and grabbed his stuff and, and got in the car and were taken off. And so we get down there to El Centro, and, of course, we stop someplace and have to have a get a Dr. Pepper because that's what uh, for Brother Duncan. So stop and get something to drink, and uh, Dennis says, well, I'm going to go change my clothes here uh, in the restroom. And so he goes in and changes his clothes. He comes out and he has a suit and tie on. Uh, back, I think he even had a three-piece suit and even a vest on. And he comes out wearing dirty tennis shoes. And Brother Duncan says, what happened? I forgot my dress shoes uh, in the trailer. And so it looked out of place. And it was funny because all night I could see Dennis sitting there kind of covering up his feet and didn't want somebody to look down at his shoes because they're out of place. They, they weren't appropriate dress. And so notice what happens. Uh, we want to make sure that we have the appropriate shoes on. Uh, we wouldn't go out and uh, wear a, a pair of sandals sometimes uh, if we're going hiking you know, on a 20-mile hike or bivouac or something else. We want to wear something that's durable, something that will allow us uh, to be able to keep on moving. Why? Because you could hurt a soldier's arms, their hands, their elbows, their soldiers, uh, their shoulders, but then they could still keep moving. But if you were to hurt their feet, they're done. They're finished. They're sitting on the sidelines. 
So we see it for protection. Number two, we see it for stability. We see it for stability. See, the Roman soldier wore a thick-soled, hobnailed Samai boot. It had straps that tied around the foot so that it was tight. On the bottom of the soles were hobnails, which were little pieces of metal which protruded to give them a grip on the soil. And the shoe gave them firmness of footing so that they could stand in battle. And so if they were to back up or begin to get some leverage, if you would, fighting somewhere, uh, fighting someone, they could put their foot down and it would give them stability because it wouldn't slide back because these nails on the bottom of their shoe would dig into the soil and give them good footing. Uh, it would be the same if you would, like someone that golfs, they have those golf shoes with uh, small spikes on the bottom or football or something else like that that would give them stability. And so the soldier would need stability. And so Paul pictures a Roman soldier. Go with me again, if you would, to our text. And notice what he says in verse uh, number 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to do what? Stand. Notice, not being knocked down, not sit down, but to stand. And so if we had slick bottom shoes, what will happen to us? We're going to move back, and we could fall back. But notice, we wear the shoes that He tells us to wear. It will give us stability so that we will not slip, we will not slide, we will not fall. But we'll be able to hold our ground. But what does this mean, though? We see it has functions for the soldier, but what does it mean for the Christian? See, we can have our waist cinched with commitment and be wearing the breastplate of a godly and righteous life, life, but unless we stand on our feet, guess what will happen to us? We will fall. And so we need a solid base on which to stand. And the shoes guard us as we stand. And when we stand because of Christ, we stand where? In peace. In Amen. peace. Could it be the reason why we are no longer fighting the battle is because our peace has been stolen? Uh, maybe because of the lack of faith or, or because of fear has taken away our peace. And if that's the case, then I can guarantee you this. We're not standing up in a battle because we're too fearful. Or our faith, we, we think that whatever comes at us, we're not going to be able to defeat it or even begin to fight it. So what happens then? Man, we're going to fall or we're going to sit or we're going to withdraw ourselves uh, from the battle. We're not going to be able to stand. The Apostle Paul says, man, we're to put on the armor of God so that we'll be able to stand and be have a solid foundation. Well, what is the fundamentals of standing? The fundamentals of standing. Notice first the preparation. Our feet are to be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The word preparation means made ready or equipped. And so Paul used the word preparation. He's making a statement that our feet should be made ready by being shod. Our feet are to be equipped and our feet are to be prepared. The word stand. He's not speaking about going. And he's not speaking about walking. I've heard people say what we need to do. We need to rush into hell. And just take it over. <laughs> Paul never says that. And in, this, in our text it never says that. What does he tell us to do? Well he tells us three times. That we are to stand. Notice with me in verse 11. May be able to stand. In verse 13 says, having done all to stand. Verse 14, stand therefore. See, not one time did he say, you're to advance or you're to retreat. What he does say, we are to stand. We are to stand. Here's something interesting, and I think we'd all agree with this. If we begin to retreat, how much more difficult is it to be able to advance? See, once we move back, 
the enemy steps forward and how much more difficult is it to be able to advance once that we have retreated. Paul says we're not to retreat and we're not to advance, but we are to stand. See, we're not to give him any ground whatsoever. We don't need to advance on him. Do you know why? He is already defeated. See, we don't need to advance to defeat the foe. The foe has already been defeated. And we ought not to retreat. Why? Because the foe has already been defeated. Man. And when we retreat, that means that we have been defeated. Or we're giving up ground. He says, don't go forward. The enemy's been defeated. And don't back up. Because the same thing. The enemy has been defeated. Right. We are to stand. Stand, therefore. And having done all to stand. And then stand and not give up any ground. So the preparation then is for us to stand. See, it's important to remember that Paul's not referring to evangelizing the lost or even preaching the gospel. He's referring in our text of fighting the devil, resisting the devil, standing and being aware of what the devil's wiles or methods are. And so the gospel of peace is to be preached. We understand Man. that. In fact, Romans chapter 10, verse 15 tells us that the feet of those that go and preach are beautiful. But in our text here, that's not what Paul's speaking about. He's speaking about standing. He's not talking about preaching to Satan. Satan's not going to listen to us. Our responsibility is when we put on the armor of God is not to advance and not to retreat. See, he is saying that since our, our feet are shod with the good news of peace, we can stand our ground. We don't need to slip. We don't need to slide. We don't need to fall when we're under attack. So the preparation. Well, what exactly then is the gospel of peace? The gospel of peace, uh, we know that good news of peace, it means the good news of peace. Uh, we know the gospel means good news. We understand that. And so we are at war with God. But listen to this. We were at war with God. But it was Christ that made peace. See, all humankind is an enemy of God. And yet Christ makes peace a reality. So when Satan attacks us, our feet are rooted firmly on the solid ground of the gospel of Amen. peace. And not because we have made peace, but because God has come and made peace, if you would, because of us. When we have peace with God, we have peace within. And Satan wants to destroy our peace. See, due to being in Christ, being saved, in the midst of our battles and struggles, he comes to us, Christ does, and speaks words of truth and peace. He reminds us he'll ever be with us. He'll never leave us never forsake us. He reminds us of the peace that we have with God. He reminds us that He has overcome the world. He reminds us that we can do all things through Him and His strength. And so notice, those things are what He has done for us. That's why we can have peace. See what happens to us? Our emotions, when we're not covered or we've not pulled down the stronghold, or we've not cast our imaginations away from us, then our peace begins to leave us. But we need to remember what Christ has done and what He is doing for us. He'll never leave us nor forsake Amen. us. He has overcome the world. We right. can do all things through Him and His strength. And we can have peace because we have the peace with God and we have the peace of God. So being assured of all that Christ has and is doing for us, we can have peace in the midst of spiritual warfare. That's why we're not going to retreat. Amen. And why we can stand. This is the last statement I'm done. Those without Christ have hearts that will fail them due to fear. But we with Christ have peace, no matter how intense or how consistent 
the enemy attacks. Amen. Isn't there a difference? Yes. Hey, those folks without Christ, they failed and their hearts failed them due to fear. We with Christ, our hearts will not fail us because we have peace. Hey, that's why we'll not retreat, why we don't need to advance. All we need to do is stand. Father, tonight we praise you again for your word. Thank you, Father, uh, that you've given us another piece of our of war, another piece of our armor so that we can go into spiritual warfare. Father, may we realize that our responsibility is not to advance and not to retreat. Because, Father, Satan has already been defeated. Our responsibility is to stand in the midst of the battle. Father, help us to stand and do all that we can to stand. We thank you for the shoes that you placed upon our feet that gives us the ability to stand. We praise you and we thank you, Father, for it. In Jesus' name, amen.